guys, welcome back for another video. Today we are taking a look and going through the new Inov N1 Pro, as they call it an all-in-one solution. This is a front and rear dash cam system with CarPlay, Android Auto, and it says comes with an intelligent navigation system. I don't know what that means. I don't know if they're talking about the CarPlay and Android Auto, like all the other devices out there, use the navigation of your choice, or if there's something built in. We're gonna go through it really quick, see what you get in the box. We're gonna take it out, install it on my FJR 1300, run through all its features. We'll go through everything we find during that process. Then we'll take it out on the road, do some day and night tests, and check out the unit itself and the dash cam footage. Let's get it unboxed. Well, that's a beautiful inlay here. Hold on a second. When you open the box, you got this cool scenery that unfolds. Really reminds me of the books that I grew up with <laughs> as a kid. Man, those days are long gone, huh? And again, if you're watching this kind of series I'm doing, uh, just looking at a review card and a header sheet here, I'm going to have a complete buyer's guide of all these, and I've still got more coming. There's, I've still got some here waiting and I've still got some in the mail, plus whatever comes in the future. So I'm gonna be doing a big feature overview and buyer's guide so people can really kind of see what's out there and see which one is going to be the best fit for your needs. Just some more cards there. Oh, we got a big widescreen unit. I'll give you my first impressions about this in a second. Just wanna get it clear two cameras and these are definitely unique they may be exclusive to Inov, which have been done in the past as opposed to i think all the others that i've done they've used third-party cameras that you know are shared among different brands they might change the specs here and there and obviously different logos but we haven't seen these bullet types until now so i'm assuming there's going to be some kind of proprietary mounts in there it would be really awesome if they were gopro compatible mounts have yet to see that from anybody. So I'm just gonna pass these back through here. <laughs> Where does the circle go? That's right, in the square. All right, we're getting there. We got one camera free. This is probably the front, very short cable. Okay, they're probably interchangeable, probably have an extension, another identical camera. And let me feed these through. And there's our extension. It's attached to the head unit wiring. That's obviously for the camera. Take a look at that in a second. We have our power wiring bundle. Pretty standard fare there. I like that they don't, I was gonna say, I like that they don't put ends on. They did it for some of those, but I prefer bare wire. Let's you do what you want. We've got positive and negative standard US coloring here. Positive and negative is red and black with yellow your switch for power. And then an inline fuse. Haven't seen that on all the devices, but some. I still recommend going through your own dedicated fuse block, of course. I have another video on that. We've got a bar mount bracket. We'll take a look at that. Obviously, you won't be using that. We'll do something else. And some kind of strap here. We've got some cable organizers and some sticky tape for the cameras. Looks like one of these packs per camera. A couple different pads. I like that they give you extra. Some zip ties, some Allen wrenches, a tiny little Phillips, and a wrench. I don't know if this has tire pressure monitors or not. Looks like maybe not. Not sure what that wrench is for yet. Got some stickers and installation diagram. Ooh, this thing's huge. Like map sized. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Holy moly. Yeah, you gotta see this. Look at this. Just goes on and on and on. Oh, there's more. Down here. <laughs> That's just one side. They got this side. Yeah, it's a big manual. That's cool. More info the better. Let me scooch this. We'll take a look at the head unit, the star of the show. I'm not sure why I call them head units. You know, I'm an I'm a guy where I did audio, car audio in the 90s. So head units is part of my vernacular. I think we have a screen protector on here because this thing looks like schmutz. Let's see if it comes off. I mean, protective film, not 
protector. I'm not sure now. Oh, that's got to come off because it doesn't rub off and it's all matty. If it's a protector, it's stuck on there. There we go. That's really thick. But yeah, it does come off. That looks beautiful. Love it. So bezels aren't too bad. Let me make sure you guys can see them there. I think you can see the top one there a little bit. About half my thumb width. Totally normal. And then down at the bottom here, we have, I assume, access for the micro SD card and maybe a USB port. We have sealed wires, three of them coming out the back. We've got a big, chunky aluminum mount. And there is a screw behind this. So this piece here probably has other options. Model 12 volt in, serial number. The unit itself is hard plastic. This bracket feels like definitely aluminum. And we've got some vibration mitigation. These are rubber bushings, but they're very hard. I can't move this at all, but it probably helps a little bit. And then just the gorgeous screen, we have no hard buttons. So everything is going to be software controlled. Well, looking at the manual here, we have a section on tire pressure monitoring, but I don't think I have sensors. Maybe it's optional. I'm looking here real quick just to see if it is optional. Oh yeah, it is. Hmm. They didn't send them down here. It says tire pressure sensor optional. Well, that's a bummer that they didn't send those. That would have been very complete. <laughs> anyway, that is it for the boxing and what you get in this basic model, at least. So let's go ahead and throw it on the bike. See what we get for install. I'm a little concerned that there isn't any other mount option. So maybe I'll have to create something on my own to get it on a Ram ball or a GoPro mount like I've done in the past. Let's go find out. All right, first challenge will be where and how I want to mount this. I'm first going to disassemble everything so I can get a real good look to see what we're working with. And then I'll figure out what I want to do as far as putting it on the bike. Cable wise, it is pretty typical. Got a pretty good length here. So we don't have connections right up near the unit. I like that. Easy to run and hide wires and make sure all the connections are inside the bike somewhere. And I will put a link to a timestamp on a previous review where I go in full detail of how I wired a system into the FJR. And that's pretty much going to apply to any unit. It'll just give you some real good ideas here for how you might want to mount any system on an FJR. The fasteners on the back here are three mil and unlike the previous review, nice fasteners, nice and snug. Good solid screws, good solid metal inserts. The aluminum bracket here has the built-in vibration bushings and we've got, it looks like a five mil screw on here to take this little piece off. And under that, a faceted cutout. So we got this here. All right, I found a perfect mounting solution here. I've got a one inch Ram ball from the Ram GoPro foot. And it's Ram there. I'll try to find this separately. I can't remember if I got this in an accessory pack or with another product or I just bought it separately or whatever, but it's probably very inexpensive. Anyway, it's just a screw on the underside, goes through and a nut to the top of the ram bolt and there's just enough threads to go fully into that lock nut so i'm just going to put this back on and then i can mount that to any of my ram ball accessories there we go nice easy mount onto my left ball Geeky. tell you what i am not at all a fan of these mounts all right so here's what you need to do grab your bracket and your adhesive rubber pad Disassemble this, both screws, take out the centerpiece. So I haven't taken the backing off just to show you here, but take the backing off, pinch it like this, and then very carefully set it and make contact whoo, right in the middle, and then spread it from there. So you're gonna adhere it to the inside of the bracket. And then you can spread it and barely squeeze the camera in there and kind of wiggle it down to where you need it. Once you tighten this down though, it's not going to be able to rotate. So 
Leave these a little bit loose, however you're gonna mount it to the bike, whether you're gonna use the bracket or the 3M pad or whatever, because you need this completely loose to rotate the barrel once you figure out your orientation. So going along with things I really don't care for with these mounts, seriously. Uh, if I were in of, I just realized to put that on upside down, it doesn't make any difference. I would completely ditch this design. I don't know if they're just using these cameras off the shelf, you know, from another manufacturer, and this is how they come, or if they had a say in this design. But either way, these do not inspire confidence. And let me show you why. First of all, this is the configuration if you're going to mount it with a sticky pad. So obviously very conventional design, obviously not GoPro compatible, but the same type of thing. You can rotate it and you can pivot it and you can put it in most places, but you are relegated again to horizontal surfaces like some others we've seen. However, big problems and why I would not trust this mount as far as I can throw it. Uh, I could probably throw it pretty far, but not that far. Number one, if you're gonna use this, put Loctite on all three of these bolts because there is nothing locking them in place other than a little bit of friction. So any kind of vibration, let's pretend that this is stuck down to the bike. I'll show you that, and that's another issue. This whole thing rotates on this bolt. So a little bit of vibration could loosen this whole thing up. I just loosened it a little bit by turning it. But there's, there's no nut, there's no locking mechanism. So all three of these are just in, you know, hand tight and they just sit there. The other issue is, and this is the correct way of doing it, I verified against the instructions. You just bolt this thin plate down using this short bolt here. However, when you put the sticker on, the bolt is at best even with the sticker. A little hard here with one hand, hang on. So when you put the sticker on, it's got this hole cut out for the bolt. You take that red backing off and at best, that bolt is even with the sticker. There's no room to compress this down and get a great adhesion to the surface that you're trying to put it on. So I'm not gonna use this. What I'm gonna do is just use my own tape and put two pieces, one on either side, and double them up so that they are extra thick and clear this bolt. I could even do two short pieces here and then one big piece to cover all three. Not a fan. There is a lot of room for improvement there in this design. And there we go, there's my tape. I went three thick, mine's slightly thinner than the tape they supplied, so two wasn't quite giving me where I wanted to be. But you can see now the tape clearly has a little bit above that bolt. So now I feel confident that the tape is actually gonna hold to whatever surface I put it on. Could even go one layer more just for satisfaction. There we go, perfect height. Good enough for the review. Okay, got everything wired up. I'll put a link down to, again, detailed wiring for this particular bike if you wanna wire any dash cam unit. Got the front and rear cams just loosely mounted for now. I have to aim them, haven't fired it up at all, so I have no idea where they're going to be exactly pointed. Let's turn it on for the first time. Check out the boot time, that was pretty quick. Oh man, first I thought there was a film on there, that little guy, that little rider there looked like a reflection. <laughs> nice saturation there, that looks pretty good. Okay, so we've got the non-installed tire pressure sensors up there. Oh, first of all, very high resolution, nice looking screen. We've got some European spellings and unit of measures. Got a little blinking indicator that we're auto recording. So interconnect is the CarPlay. I'll do that in a moment. Dash cam. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so high res, nice looking picture there. And it's a split screen. I was like, what am I looking at? So that's my front cam twisted 90 degrees clockwise and my rear is pretty much upside down. <laughs> What was that on the screen? Okay, so we've got 
This is our lock. If we want to lock the current clip, take a snapshot, stop and start recording. What's this guy do? Loop recording? Oh, flip the screens. Nice. So we can go between full screens like that. That is simply a must for any dash cam system, in my opinion. That's loop recording here. Settings. Uh, back camera mirror, if we want to flip it, resolution. So only one, 1080p, both of these. These are 120 degree field of views. Most others I've been doing have been 140, so this is going to be a little narrower. You're going to see better detail of what's in front of you with the expense of not seeing quite so much from the side. I've had both, and I've gone to 140 in my cars especially in the front because I like to see at intersections more of what's on screen from the sides. It's nice having the clearer detail when you're just going straight down the road and seeing everything a little bit farther, but I find for dash cam use, I would rather have more on the screen and give up a little bit of front detail, but 120 is still nice and wide. You're not going to miss too much. And let's see what else is in settings. Date watermark, probably yes or no. Yep, we'll leave that on. Record settings, what do we have? Oh, recording settings, off and on. That, hmm, not very intuitive. Recording settings, I don't know what that would be turning on or off. I'll try to figure that out. Loop recording, just on or off probably. Oh, the duration, we'll set that to five minutes. That's your clip size. And let's go back home. So let's see, main settings, link show. Okay, so obviously there's not a lot of native English in the menus. Link show, ah, full screen front rear all. I don't understand what link show is supposed to mean. Uh, what? I think that said restarting. I'm not sure because as soon as I clicked all it just rebooted let's see what's different i'm not sure what that setting does yet <laughs> anything different in dash cams no let me see what that said it's fairly responsive when you click a button there is a slight delay that's definitely noticeable not as fast as another unit i reviewed a while ago but it's not bad and the screen is Big, bright, easy to read, no problem there. Stop it, it automatically goes off of a screen after a few seconds of not touching it. I don't like that. Link show, full screen front, I don't know. I'm gonna leave it on full screen. Do you wanna restart immediately? It must have registered my finger near the screen when I clicked it last time. Anyway, let's take a look and see if we can determine what that's doing at all. All right, what else do we have? Takes a while to get up that setting screen. Time format, let's see if we can set these. I prefer 12 hour, that's the only thing you can do, okay. Time setting, here we go. Year, what is today? And I'll set my time zone. Does this have GPS? I thought it did. Maybe I read something else, but I'm negative five. Usually if you have GPS, your time zone is automatically set. Not always, but we'll see. Language, do we have anything but English? Nope, just English, all right. Sometimes there's UK and US English, and that'll change things like spelling of tire and things like that, not a huge deal. Pressure, probably can't do anything about that. Let's see, tire of the Y. <laughs> T-I-R-E here in the States. Well, we can change that anyway. It would be nice if it would completely remove the displays on the home page if you don't have them attached. And in this case, they didn't send them, so I can't even test them. Wow, that was quite a delay coming back to the home screen. Okay, so, and this is going to play whatever footage you have recorded. And that's just what I've recorded here since I turned it on. You can see your snapshots, your videos, or any of your locked clips. Now, this font is pretty small. Now, you would not obviously be going in here at all while you're writing. This is okay to be small, so no problem there. 
These are big enough absolutely to hit with your glove. So I would like that pressure readout completely removed or an option to do so because if you don't have the tire pressure monitoring, that's just garbage on the screen. That's weird. This is so sensitive. This is how far away from the unit my finger is. I just did that. I mean, it's like an inch, inch and a half away from the screen and it's registering capacitive touch. That's what I did. I wasn't even near the screen. It's weird. A little oversensitive there. Is that all it does? Just dash cams and CarPlay? Could be. Android Auto. I want Apple. All right, so that's just that. We all know what CarPlay looks like, and that completely depends on your apps and what you're going to throw up there. The screen size is pretty good. It's about, uh, well, it's about six inches diagonal. Get your normal four icon CarPlay display, just like most cars. Not too much there. So I guess in this, you're either going to be looking at your full screen dash cam or your CarPlay. That's completely fine. I would probably leave it on my rear if I'm gonna do that. Now, is there a way to turn the screen off? I didn't see anything about that because that is super important to me. Even when I'm listening to music, I don't want the screen sitting there blasting light and color for no reason if I don't need to see anything, if I'm just chilling to music. Uh, let's see, I didn't see anything about a timeout for the screensaver or anything like that. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. I still don't know what Link Show is. Link Show. Huh. I'll have to see if the instructions say anything about that. Not a clue. Bluetooth is for directly linking your phone and comms if you care to do so. No, well, that's it. All right, so there is, doesn't appear to be any way, any way to turn the screen off. When I get out on the road, we'll see if it turns off automatically after a certain time. There's no remote or anything optional like that, and there are no hard buttons. Now, I didn't see anything about screen brightness. There doesn't seem to be any setting for automatic on or off or anything like that. So. Any kind of adjustment, I guess it is what it is. We'll have to see what it does out in the sun. It looks okay in here. It's fairly bright in here. Normal, but not daylight, obviously. So let's go ahead and, well, I'll first get the cameras dialed in and then we'll take it out on the road. You can see even at 120 field of view, still gives you quite a bit of fisheye effect. We're about four feet from that door. And just for reference, the Inov logo is your up indicator. And there we go. Got them aimed and the protective film off of it. I do like how in the split screen, they actually squish the image instead of cropping off the sides. Another unit I reviewed did the crop and that just made the split screen absolutely useless because all you saw was this sliver of what was on each cam, but this is absolutely usable. Nice looking saturation. It's a little underexposed. Now I can't tell yet if that's the brightness of the screen or the actual software exposure. Plate balance looks pretty good. It's a little brighter, by the way, in the video than to my naked eye. I can tell my phone videoing the screen is enhancing it a little bit, but just note it's not bad. Not as bright as another that I did, but it's not a problem. It does have a lot of sharpening. The lines, for example, on my laundry tub there, they're almost shimmering. I wanna see what it looks like in editing, I'm curious, but on this screen, man, they have cranked edge detection and sharpness way up. You can see these halos over the little holes in the laundry basket there. They're just dark holes. I got my jacket in there, but they're glowing on the screen and that's all software image enhancement. Now, I also didn't see anything in the specs about image stabilization. So we'll see how bouncy the image looks that can have a big effect on details for dash cams. 
That looks really good. Okay. Now here in CarPlay, I want to show you a couple things that I've run into. And this may be a deal breaker for some people. We are now seeing the processor beyond its limits. We've seen the little, let me go back to the home screen here. We've seen the little slowdowns and delays here and there in the regular menu. However, in CarPlay is where they really come to light. So I'll launch title here. Quite a bit of delay when you're trying to swipe. And this is just going through playlists. All right, this should be absolutely synced to your finger. This is virtually nothing. Now, once you start playing music, I can't do it because it'll stop the video, but once you start playing music, the stop, start, fast forward, rewind and everything, those are thankfully instant. Those work as usual. But the first time this even loaded, it took over a minute just for the album art to pop in. And it supposedly has a 5G connection over Wi-Fi to the phone. So that's not the bottleneck. It's got the fastest possible connection. But here's the deal breaker. When you go into a map, this is just Apple Maps, very lightweight, very standard. You got the same delay. That in and, in and of itself is not too big of a deal. If you're just following a route and just going down a road, it's fine. But it's so slow, it doesn't properly register the pinch to zoom. It just doesn't know how to handle it. So virtually useless for actually looking around or creating a route or anything like that. So bear that in mind. This is not something that I would recommend if navigation is high on your list because you simply can't use it as intended. It's got limited functionality at best for navigation. And I still have no idea what they meant on the box. There's nothing built in uh, as far as navigation. You just have CarPlay. Seriously? So I'm running into an interesting problem here. I've been testing it just with the key on, right? And it's on a switched power supply. But when I start the bike, at least when it's in the middle of the boot process, it crashes. So I'm gonna wait a second here for it to connect to CarPlay. All right, let's go back to the home screen. I suspect this is yet another unit that requires the positive and negative to be on constant power and it will not operate correctly on switched. So now I'm going to try to start the bike and it should fully reboot. There's nothing special about the power when the bike's on or starting. All right, so it didn't even reboot. That's good. Like I said, there's nothing special about the bike power. If the key is on, this is receiving power. But during the start process, I think the voltage, this might just be super sensitive and it crashes for some reason. So if you have it on switched power, you have to wait until it's fully booted to start your bike. So this is going to be a rather short review. There aren't too many things to go over and test. We're going to be keeping an eye on the display. I want to be out for several minutes, let this really heat up here in the direct hot Florida sun. We're just under 90 degrees. And we're just going to make sure it doesn't want to dim like some other units do when they start to get hot. I'm going to just keep this on dash cam. This should give it the most intensive workout. CarPlay is connected, so the processor is working at its most. We're going to, of course, check out the dash cam footage in a few scenarios, front and rear. And then after this, we'll go check out nighttime footage. So I'm going to switch this to front view. There we go little bit of a tilt on the camera mount that's all right good enough for the test okay standard fare we're going to be looking for exposure see how it handles bright blown out clouds in the sky
dark shadows in the trees at the same time, details in the asphalt. And these are uploaded in extreme quality to YouTube, so make sure that you're selecting 4K to get the full signal and full processing on whatever you're watching it on. And everything is exactly the same settings on all of these reviews. And I do have more coming, by the way. I'm only about halfway through the stack. We've got a nice clock in the corner, extremely easy to read. So far, brightness is absolutely perfect. Full sun here and everything looks clear as a bell, same as it did in the garage. Doesn't matter if I'm in direct sun here or the shadows. It's a glossy screen, but I don't have any kind of glare. We do have the subtle little red blinking dot in the corner just to let you know that it is indeed recording. Tires actually feel a little mushy right now. I would appreciate the tire pressure monitoring system on this unit so I could check, but I've been putting units on and off so much and I haven't been topping the tires off. I'm sure they're down into the mid to upper 30s now instead of low 40s. I can tell by feel just a couple pounds difference on this bike. Beautiful looking color and saturation, just looking down at the screen. That's really nice. Instant touch sensitivity, I absolutely love that. So if you are coming to a stop, boom, just a quick tap and there's your rear view camera. If you're looking for a really good dash cam system that happens to give you car play and, oop, got a raccoon crossing the road, go buddy and happens to give you CarPlay for listening to your music. And I'd say navigation in a pinch. I would not recommend this as a primary navigation tool, as in you want one thing and you want it to do navigation really well, that's a high priority for you. This is not gonna be the one. Now, if you're just casually following routes, you don't use it that much. You're mainly concerned with, like I said, the dash cam and music. This is a great choice. Oh, and there is the dimming. I'll have to go back in editing to see if exactly when it happened. But now looking down right now, holy moly, that is half brightness just from overheating. Luckily, it's still viewable. It's not so dim that I can't see it at all, as uh, at least one other review was. However, it is extremely noticeable. All right, so let's run out to the highway real quick. We're gonna get behind some cars and see how easy it is to read plates. All right, getting behind this guy here. I think that's a Cadillac. Two car lengths, should be very easy to read. I think he's turning. Three car lengths, four. So there you go. That should give you an idea of how good the resolution is on the system. All right, let's go to night. Okay, let's wrap this up with the night test. And after this, I'm going to come back and kind of give you some post slash during editing wrap up because I will have to wait until it's pretty much complete to know a couple things. And that's specifically with dealing with the files. And that's because there is no app. There is no way to download any footage to your phone. Now that may be a deal breaker for some people. You know, this is primarily a dash cam system and dash cams have one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to capture stuff if shit happens. Now, <laughs> if you're in a crash or something or you witness something and you wanna send somebody the file or show a cop, send something to your insurance agent, et cetera, et cetera, uh, if you don't happen to have a computer, you're screwed because that card is just sitting there in the unit and you can't access it. But here at night, we're looking for camera detail. We're looking for how the lights and shadows and pixelation looks and all that kind of good stuff. And I see I still have to fine tune my headlights. I haven't finished that yet. Looking at the unit itself, it's pretty bright. It's a little too bright for nighttime use. Now there is no automatic brightness control on this. And while it was sufficient for a daytime use, definitely could have been brighter, but it was sufficient. It is slightly too bright for nighttime use. So you will be using the manual brightness control, which 
again, is buried in the CarPlay menu for some reason, not in the main settings, to adjust day versus night. So that's uh, another minor drawback. Again, not a huge deal breaker, but definitely behind some of the other guys. So here we've got nice bright lights, brightly lit parking lot. Is there a car coming? I thought there was. Buzz through here real quick. Shouldn't have any problems with this. Front and rear. And then we'll zip out on the highway real quick just to see if anything odd happens out there. I doubt it. Oh man, I was looking at those triangle wheels on that Miata flashback. I had those are very similar on a 1995 Sunfire GT, number 27 ever produced. What a piece of junk, but I love that car. That was in the shop. Oh, dozens of times. So many problems, early production. But it had those very unique triangle wheels. Vintage 90s. So this should look really darn good. Front and rear, I don't expect to see anything unusual at all. Oh, one other thing to note, this does hold the time and date just fine, even on completely switched power. So if you don't care about having to wait for it to do that weird boot thing, you can connect it to completely switched power, which is exactly what I would do rather than connecting this to switched power or unswitched power and then running your battery down, or at least running the risk of your battery running down. Okay, so just to wrap this up, I'm in the middle of editing. Now I've got a feel for everything from start to finish. Uh, little tiny quick background. Pretty much every dash cam out there with very few exceptions, like Garmin, for example, they produce their files in a file format called .ts. And it's just fine for working in the unit, playing back through the unit, just fine if the unit has an app and transferring to a phone and doing editing in that. No problem, because that's proprietary. However, given that you have to pull the card and just, here you go, raw files, this becomes a problem because you can't edit .ts files. You can send a whole chunk to somebody, you can play them on just about any computer, but you can't do anything with them. If you need to trim them, get the audio out, send a clip of it, anything like that, you can't edit it. You have to convert each and every TS clip front and rear separately with a third party program first to be able to use it in any kind of video editor. It takes a lot of time, it's a major pain in the butt, and this requires it to do anything other than just send the whole file. So just bear that in mind. Again, dash cams are not action cams, they're not your trip cams. Do not ever think of any dash cam system to be used like that. But I'm just saying it. All the other units, I can forgive them using TS format. And the reason they use that TS format, it's a streaming format. It's made to just record and append to the end until your end time and then start a new clip. That's what that file format is for. So it's perfect for dash cams. It's not meant to be a linear editor like MP4. All the other ones, I can forgive it because they have apps and you don't need to do that. I need to do that to produce these videos for you, but you don't need to do that if you need to get a clip. You just use your app and your phone for that particular device that this doesn't have. So that's it. Hope it helps. Stay tuned. Got many, many more coming right up.